Uh, so I actually think that that's an example of the system working. Thank you very much. Well, listen, I think you've really sort of set out the uh, agenda um, very well. I think at, at, at this point, I'd like to invite uh, our other two panelists to come up to the stage. And we're very lucky to have um, Sri Mulyani, Managing Director of the World Bank and uh, former Finance Minister of uh, Indonesia, and uh, Deb Henretta, Group President of Procter & Gamble and also the Chair of ABAC. If you could welcome to the, them to the stage, please. Now, I am going to open this up to the floor, though not quite yet. Um, uh, so I'm going to ask a few more questions. But if you could uh, sort of be preparing, thinking um, questions. Let me start um, with Sri Mulyani. I, I want to actually go back to the question that uh, I posed to the Prime Minister at first, because I think it's a kind of crucial starting point for this debate, which is basically this perception that free trade destroys good jobs, it doesn't make them. We were told it was going to make good jobs, and now uh, you know, there's a fair constituency out there, perhaps not at this meeting, but you know, in the real world, let's say, that believes that, uh, uh, that, believes that free trade you know, sort of puts crushing pressure on the middle class. That's certainly uh, um, something that people in America might, might, might argue. Well, well, what do you say to that? I think it really depends on how you see it in this case. It's definitely in any policy there is always a winner and loser. And this is exactly in which the free trade, while it is really promoting in terms of the productivity, innovation, technology, which is at the end is really benefiting the global population. But certainly within this free trade, there is always those who will suffer because of the competition. And this is exactly that how for many policymakers in the world actually try to redesign their policy in order to make sure that the benefit of free trade can actually offsetting or in this case can address those who is going to lose from the competition without distorting the benefit itself. Because you don't want in this case the consumer to get a lower quality, high price product. The consumer definitely is also a political constituent. But those who are going to be losing from the competition, that is the job of the policymaker to make sure that whether the school, the skill, or training that can really help the population to be able to always catch up with this competition. It's not always easy, of course, because changing of technology, as well as the speed of all these chains, is actually much faster than the ability of both policymakers as well as the human capital to always keep up with the change itself. So there is always a downside risk, but I think it's not supposed to be become the reason for any country to abandon this one, because then you are giving up a much bigger benefit of this free trade itself. Yes. I and many countries are actually now dealing with this, what you call it, the growth without job, or jobless growth. And this is especially uh, very pervasive in the bigger population uh, country. But this is exactly the challenge of many policymakers in the world now, that they have to integrate their education policy, which is even from the very early childhood, because when you talk about competition and preparing the population and workforce to be ready, they actually cannot be addressed when you are in a school age. Even in this case, at birth, you really have to prepare with a good parental and uh, the health and nutrition, which is going to have the long time effect to this workforce or the baby in this case. And then you also have to have the discussion about, or in this case, policy, which is addressing on a skill and vocational. We have quite a lot of, in this case, even in a more, I mean, we are not going to live in a perfect world, but even if you are going to be very uh, agile and, in this case, uh, anticipating the change itself, the country is always have this potential lag behind of the changing technology. So in this case, the policy in this, by the policymaker need to make sure that the change is going to be continue. It's not right. going to be like one, uh, time education. Yes, um, I think you make a very interesting point uh, at the beginning of what you said there, which is that it's often easier to identify people who've lost than people who've won. Mm -hmm. A colleague of mine, mm -hmm. uh, who was a former Beijing bureau chief, went to the Midwest of America and stood outside a Walmart and asked everybody coming out, would you like to thank the people of China? 
um, for making these cheap, fabulous goods for you. And of course, people looked at him bemused because mm -hmm. for them, China was a, was a threat in a sense mm -hmm. to their jobs, not, mm -hmm. not making cheap products for them. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, uh, I think an anecdote that, that, that sure. sort of helps explain this a little bit. And um, Deb, can I bring you in and sure. basically ask you the same, the same question? I mean, there is this perception. I do want to talk about education in a minute, and I'll bring the audience in actually um, in a second, but I'd just like to put basically the same question to Sri Mulyani. I mean, if you're looking across the various countries um, in APEC, and I mean, what, you know, we, we tend to talk about APEC as though it's this one big happy union, but of course, you know, we're running from countries that are reasonably poor, um, Vietnam, to middle income um, countries, uh, Malaysia, um, uh, to, you know, very high income, Australia, Japan, the US, um, etc. Presumably they need kind of different, uh, different splits between the type of jobs they do. So how would you both, I mean, it's a kind of a double pronged question really. I mean, how, how should economies think about manufacturing jobs, if that's not an old fashioned term, and maybe it is now, and other types of jobs? And how does that change between um, countries at kind of different levels of development? Well, the, I think in this case, uh, the idea of country have one only comparative advantage is no longer there in the way that many countries, and especially because of the connectivity and globalize, they actually the idea of one product with a different value chains and it's been produced I mean, across the border. It's really changed in terms of what you call it, the specialized or comparative advantage of one dedicated country. Manufacturing is certainly is going to be still a very important sector in the global world. And the APEC region is definitely very strong in this manufacture. And if you can see that many countries have been changing from the agriculture base into industrial base, it's really driven by this, the usually labor intensive relocation of FDI, and that create what you call it more of economic of scale. And that's happened in many of the ASEAN country from China, Indonesia, in the past is of course uh, uh, Japan and South Korea. But then it is going to be like move up to the more sophisticated with the service base. It doesn't mean when the country moving from agriculture, manufacturing, and into services base that you are no longer pay attention to the agriculture. Look at the past five years in which when you talk about the food price, that's become the big challenge for many policy makers. And that's why attention to the agriculture, but then you put a lot of technology, which is going to be more and more, in which case, productivity for square meter of the land is going to be very, very important. And in this case, you cannot actually differentiate between agriculture primary product with the manufacturer secondary product and services based on technology, which is on a tertiary level. That's become one package. So the lesson here is actually how a country can invest, and this is the area which the World Bank work very uh, hard in support many of the country, who actually have to deal simultaneously, especially you mentioned about the low income, middle income mm -hmm. country. They are still dealing with many of them actually how to reach the goal of uh, MDG, which is really reducing the absolute poverty. Here you're talking about the early childhood, you're talking about basic education. Some country is moving to the middle income country or even higher income country. They have a different in terms of their capacity to design their own policy, but at the same time, they are seeking and looking that the change is so rapid. And that's why this policy maker really want to hear from the private sector. They learn from the other country, which is more advanced. And especially, I, I guess in this case, the aspect of demographic change change a lot in terms of the composition of the age as well as what education and skill that need to be built. This is the area in which the global, idea, the global environment is really forcing a lot of policy makers that they can no longer thinking about skill or in this case human resource in the stock in which that how many population at what age uh, with what education level. level. They are not talking about the pool of skill or talent. And that's why the design of policy is going to be totally changed. I'm going to touch the issue of the higher education because many of the low middle income country in order to provide with the labor, cheap labor, but productive 
and reliable, you're focusing on a basic, secondary, and vocational training. Mm -hmm. But many countries now moving to the higher level. That's why they, they need to really invest in a higher education. But the higher education policy in the past or even in, at the present in many countries is actually designing in a more isolated way. It is not linked with the private sector, with actually even in this case with the whole educational transition of within the, within the country itself. And that's why I think the reform within the education, especially at the higher level, that general level, is going to be also important to link them with the research and development innovation, but also in this case in terms of how they can provide with the skilled educated labor that can become the source of innovative an entrepreneur within the country or even across the border of the country. So, thank uh, you. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. I'd like to bring the uh, audience in now. Um, remember, we're talking about uh, work, the workforce um, in the 21st century. We've got quite a lot of hands. Um, should we start there? Um, can we get a microphone over there? Could you identify yourselves uh, uh, and ask a question? Uh, no speeches, please. And if you want to address a particular panel member, can you also uh, make that clear? Thank you. Thank you and good afternoon. My name is David Spears. I'm the Deputy Mayor of the City of Marion in Prime Minister Gillard's native South Australia. And I'm here today with the APEC Voices of the Future delegation. My question focuses in on the role of universities. And we've already had quite a few comments about the talent pool, both this morning and, and again this afternoon. If you look down the list of leading universities in the world, there are very few in the Southeast Asia area, Australia and New Zealand, and, and those are clustered in Europe and Northeast America. I wondered how can we, I would like your thoughts on how we can look at building the capacity of our universities so we can have leading universities in this region. There's some very good ones in Hong Kong, by the way, but, uh, <laughs> uh, where I live. Uh, would you like to address that to anyone in particular? Shall, I, shall we start with the Prime Minister? Look, I, I think that's a very good question, and uh, trying to um, improve a number of our universities has been part of the reform uh, suite that we've brought to universities. Uh, when, when we came to government, essentially, uh, the funding system and the uh, control system from Canberra was treating every university as if it was the same. And what we've done instead is to put funding um, on a demand basis, so uncapped funding. That means universities can choose to grow. But we've also said that we want a compact relationship with each university, which uh, recognises that they will differentiate their mission. And so some will choose to be uh, small, elite, and, and driving themselves in up the, up the uh, rankings with a real focus, a driving focus on research. Some will choose to be uh, mass educators of undergraduate students and conceptualise that as their mission. Uh, some will want to be a university very much with a sense of place. So, for example, James Cook University in Townsville is unashamedly uh, the university for north and far north Queensland. It wants to be known globally as having an edge in all things to do with the tropics, like tropical medicine. Uh, but it doesn't, you know, it, that's its mission. It's not trying to do a whole host of other things. It's trying to focus on that. So I don't think that's the whole of the answer, but it's the start of the answer by, uh, by enabling some of our universities to deliberately get themselves on a path of further and further prestige and further and further excellence that will enable them to advance up those rankings. Sri Malian, if I could bring you in here, I mean, j just briefly, but first of all, is it true? Is there a lack of world-class universities in this uh, neighbourhood? And second, um, Indonesia, let's take Indonesia. What would Indonesia have to do to produce a world-class university? Can it aspire to that? Well, it, uh, definitely, I think, with the mobility of the labor, uh, actually, you can always buy a skill, especially for a company which operate internationally. So what you call it, the scarcity of labor, is actually relative in terms of how you can provide. But you asked the second question about Indonesia and the university, how they can produce the world-class uh, 
scale of labor. I think this is really touching the issue of what I mentioned earlier. I mean, the design of the curriculum in this case and also the governance of the university is definitely will affect in terms of what product that they are going to produce. Um, in the past, maybe it's more like the academic or in the pure science and knowledge, which is I think they have this kind of luxury which is not connected with the real world um, job uh, need for the the, 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 the graduate, and this is no longer become tenable. And many of uh, the uh, university graduate, this is not only in Indonesia. I mean, in in the Arab uh, world, in which this the Arab Spring happened, is really young, educated, but they cannot find a job, mm -hmm. and that's become really a challenge of many countries in the world. So, how you are going to make sure that university is really become part of the whole? the economic system or even in the society because they cannot disconnect it with the society in which they live. And that is actually the, the, the heart of it. If it is related to the science, I think the budget is definitely important to dedicate that, but also in terms of governance and accountability, autonomy and independency of those who really deal and manage this university. Second, I think the role of private sector is important. I think how they can link and communicate in terms of what kind of skill, knowledge, as well as uh, talent which is needed by the private sector, as well as actually in this case linking with the research and technology and innovation. Uh, this is, can be also actually collaboration between public and private, because in this case government can provide with a certain funding, but it will not always adequate. You can invite the private sector, and in this case, you have a pool talent of people who has a very high intellectual capacity so that they can explore and become a good and uh, uh, innovative in, in providing with research and, and development. So this is the area which I think is going to be very important on a higher, uh, higher uh, education reform, both in terms of funding, in terms of the curriculum content, as well as the linkage with the private sector or in, in terms of uh, research and technology. Thank I think... You. Sorry, can I just yeah. bring in... Is that sure. okay? Let me, let me... Because we had a number of questions here. There was a question down here and then over there. But down, down here first, please. Uh, my name's James Bond, believe it or not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> My parents have a bad sense of humour. Uh, 